Good day, I'm Norman Wahlberger, and today we're carrying on with our slow and gradual resurrection of Boole's original thinking. So this is a major development in the middle of the 19th century where George Boole takes the logic that has been established for the last 2,000 years building on Aristotle and mathematically models it. So he takes classical logic and he abstracts from it an essential mathematical aspect and then studies that mathematical aspect individually. This is a, a very powerful idea to take some aspect of the real world, look at some portion of it, model it mathematically and then apply it back to the, uh, to the original situation. Now, of course, that is not an ironclad kind of uh, automatic kind of thing. So there's questions of interpretation and meaning when we do that. So the correspondence is not always exact. And we have to recognize that there's a separation between the mathematics that's modeling something and the original situation, which is typically a little bit more messy or convolved or just more complicated. Okay, so we're looking at Aristotle's square of opposition, these four different types of forms which figure in Aristotle's syllogisms. And uh, we have algebraic equivalents of them now through Boole's algebra. So let's just remind ourselves what they are. So the four forms are every Q is a P. Here's Aristotle's kind of notation, PAQ. And here's Boole's reformulation of that in the algebra, um, Q times one plus P equals zero. Here is no Q is a P, written PEQ, and it's expressed by the equation QP equals zero. And some Q is a P, that's PIQ, expressed by QP does not equal zero. So the, the opposite or the contradiction of this one here. And finally, some Q is not a P, it's represented by Q times one plus P does not equal zero. And uh, symbolically by POQ. So these are now the ingredients in the syllogisms of Aristotle, and we saw uh, with our last video that we could then prove all of the uh, first figure and second figure syllogisms of Aristotle very nicely using Boole's algebra. And I should say again that I'm reinterpreting Boole a little bit. I'm recasting his thinking, uh, so his thinking is maybe a little bit more involved, but uh, the essential aspects are really uh, that of Boole. Okay, so today we want to carry on with this, and we're going to look at the third figure syllogisms for which there's some additional complication that arises and then we want to end up with uh, finally making connection with the Boolean algebra that ended up taking over from Boole's algebra. Perhaps a little bit unfortunately and we'll start to talk about that, the relationship between those two things. So how does Boole's algebra work? How do we actually understand the meaning of the equations of Boole? So let me remind you that Boole's algebra is really working in this vector space B sub 2 to the n. It's an n-dimensional space over the Boolean bifield B2, which is 0, 1. And this is much like a field, but probably should be separate from a field. It's a bifield, has slightly different... Um, well, it's slightly different um, arithmetic, really. And then what we're really interested in is this uh, space here. And when n is 5, just to illustrate things, we can describe the situation by thinking about having five objects or perhaps beings. And these five objects can have different properties. And these quantities like p and q represent properties that these objects can have. So, for example, if we look at the first one, every Q is a P, represented by the equation Q times 1 plus P equals 0. Here's an illustration of this, this situation. So here we have two properties. Q is 10010 0, and P equals 11011. So these are just strings of binary digits, zeros and ones. But the meaning or the interpretation is that Q represents a property of five things, which is on for the first one and the fourth one, and off for the other three. So the property is being listed, it's on, off, off, on, off. And P is the pr another property, which happens to be on, on, off, on, on for the five objects. 
And we don't have to concern ourselves with the nature of the properties. And it's also not really a question of the properties being true or false. So we're separating ourselves from the, the sort of the, the, all the subtlety and the, the complexity of deciding what true and false mean in the world and substituting it with just a simple on off. The light switch is on or the light switch is off. The, uh, this is a very powerful way of just condensing our aspects so we're just looking at a portion of the, the more complicated picture. Just zero or one instead of true or false. Okay, and this example illustrates the situation here because in this case every Q is a P. What does it mean? It means that every time that Q is on, P is also on. Okay, so every object that has property Q has property P. So we might say the first object, whatever it is, is a Q because there's a 1 there and it also is a P because there's a 1 in the same position for the P. Okay, and this is then represented by this equation, which means that if we take this thing here and we multiply it by 1 plus p, which is what you get when you add 1 to this thing, just interchanges all the zeros and ones. That means we get 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. And then you multiply them component-wise, you're going to get 0, because the 1 there is then going to be multiplied by a 0 there, and the 1 there is going to be multiplied by a 0 there. So this exactly ensures that whenever there's a 1 in the Q position, there's a 1 in the P position. So that 1 plus P will have a 0 there, and then the product will be, um, will be 0. Okay, so the second example, no Q is a P. This is illustrated by this one here. So here you can see Q is, in this case, uh, on in the third and fourth positions, and P is not on in those positions. So whenever Q is on, P is not on. So no Q is a P. That's represented by the product being the zero vector. You take the product, every time you get a one here, you've got a zero to match up with it, so the product is going to be the zero vector. Some Q is a P. Here's a situation of some Q being a P. Which Q is a P? Well, if we look at these ones here, there's three that are on, and the second one is on for Q and also on for P. That's uh, captured by this equation, that the product Q times P is not equal to zero, because we take the product and we're going to get a 1 times 1. We're going to get a 1 in the second entry of the product. That means that it's not going to be zero. Okay, so that's capturing the idea that there's a Q which is also a P. And finally, some Q is not a P. That's Q times 1 plus P is not equal to zero, and here's an example of that. So some Q is not a P. Which Q is not a P? This one here, no, that's also a P. This one here, the third one is a Q, but it's not a P. In fact, also the fifth one is a Q, but not a P. All right, so this is an example of this, and it's illustrated or captured by this uh, equation. If you take the vector Q and you multiply by 1 plus P, which interchanges the zeros and ones, so that's 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, and you take the product, then you're not going to get the zero vector because there'll be a 1 here multiplying by that one and a 1 here multiplying by that one. So you're going to get 1s in the third and fifth positions. All right, so I hope this illustrates how simple and, uh, and free from philosophical considerations this is. This is purely mathematics, really just the arithmetic of zeros and ones. All philosophy has been put aside and we're just doing basic algebra and Boole then converts the Aristotelian syllogisms into just algebraic computations or deductions. All right, so now let's have a look at Aristotle's third figure syllogisms. These are syllogisms that involve a common predicate in the second spot in both of the premises. Okay, there's six of them listed in Wikipedia, and we're going to go through them. The first two, however, are a little bit more complicated, so we're going to leave them aside for the moment. We'll start with Dissimus, which is this one here. It says that PIS together with RAS implies PIR. Some S is a P. Every S is an R implies some R is a P. In terms of Boole's notation, algebra, the premises can be converted 
into these algebraic equations. This one, s times p does not equal zero. And this one, s times one plus r equals zero. Okay, so using these we have, first of all, this one we can expand. s plus s times r equals zero. And then we can bring the sr to the other side by adding sr to both sides. We get s equals sr. And now we look at the other one. So zero is not equal to sp, and we replace this s here with sr, which we're allowed to do. So this s becomes replaced with sr, and then we use associativity to write it as s times rp. This is supposedly non-zero, and that implies that r times p is not zero. That's what we want. That TC is uh, PAS, RIS implies PIR. Okay, this first one is S times 1 plus P equals 0, and this one is S times R does not equal 0. So from these, what do we do? We expand this one out as before S plus SP equals 0, so SP equals S, same kind of thing. But then we look at SPR. Okay, what do we know about this thing? Um, the SP is the same equal to S, so we could replace this with SR. And we know from the second premise here that that's not equal to zero. Okay, but if this is not equal to zero, then we can rearrange this as the factor S times PR. And so if the product of two things is non-zero, then both of the ingredients are non-zero. So we can conclude that PR does not equal zero, which is this one here. Next one is Bocardo, which states that POS and RAS implies POR. So some S is not a P, every S is an R, implies some R is not a P. Okay, the O thing is uh, product S times one plus P does not equal zero, and the A is S times one plus R equals zero. So these are the premises, and we are trying to get at uh, this thing here. Okay, so let's uh, look at this. We'll expand this out as usual, so we can conclude that S equals SR. And now we look at uh, S times 1 plus P, this thing here. We know that's not equal to 0. And we're going to rewrite that by replacing the S with SR. Okay, and then we can use associativity to multiply the r by this factor instead of by the s. So we write it as s times r times 1 plus p. All of that's not equal to 0, and so we can conclude that this product r times 1 plus p must not be the 0 vector. And that's uh, this one, p o r. And Ferrison, p e s together with r i s implies p o r. Okay, so what is this one? This one is um, no s is a p, and uh, that's s times p equals zero. Some s is an r, that's s r does not equal zero. These are the premises. So we have to look at this thing here. Okay, so we have, let's see, we start with zero is not equal to s r, and we Oh, right. How are we going from here to here? We are adding SP, which is zero. Okay, so if we add zero to S, we're still having S. So we haven't changed anything by going from here to here by adding this zero term SP. But now we can rewrite this as S times one plus P times R, and all of this is not equal to zero. And so the product of R times one plus P is not going to be zero, and that's the statement uh, P O R. Some R is not a P. Okay, so pleasant algebraic exercises, sort of at the high school level, um, and uh, I think it's, it's a nice exercise for high school students to learn this, uh, this kind of thing. It's a good introduction to um, the algebra of Boole. Okay, so we still have to deal with those other two third figure syllogisms of Aristotle, but uh, they're a little bit more subtle because involves a concept called existential import that the philosophers have. So that concerns certain types of statements, perhaps like this one. All mermaids like set theory. So suppose that we have an idea what a mermaid is and we have an idea of what set theory is. 
although actually there are different types of set theory, as we'll soon discover, but okay, anyway. Um, and let's just look at this statement and ask the question, what happens if it turns out that there are no mermaids? There are no mermaids. Is this a statement then true or false or perhaps meaningless? I think probably you could argue in any one of those three directions. There's probably some case to be made in all directions. But if the answer is false, then we'll say that P has existential import with respect to mermaids. That's the, the way the philosophers define it. So if the answer to this question is false, then this statement has existential import with respect to mermaids. Okay, um, so what about Aristotle? What does he have to say about these things? Well, I think Aristotle avoids cases where there are no incidences. So Aristotle would avoid making a statement like this if he knew already that there were no mermaids. Okay, but Boole's algebra treats things uh, somewhat differently. So there's obviously some subtlety here and that connects with the, the two remaining third order syllogisms, third figure syllogisms. Okay, so let's look at the syllogism called Dirapti, which is P-A-S, R-A-S implies P-I-R. If every S is a P and every S is an R, then some R is a P. So if we translate these things into Boole's algebra, what do we get? So this, uh, every S is a P, is S times 1 plus P equals 0. And this one here is S times 1 plus R equals 0. And we're trying to deduce this one here, which is that R times P does not equal to 0. Can we do this? Is there a logical reasoning along the lines of all the other ones I've shown you that allows you to go from these premises to this one? And the answer is no, there isn't. There is no such argument for the following reason. If you look at this particular example, so we're going back to the case of having five objects and S, P, and R are going to be properties of those objects. And suppose that S is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. That means it's a property which is not valid for all of the objects. Maybe it's the property of being a mermaid, and maybe in our population there are no mermaids. So the, the property does not apply to any of the objects, but it's still valid to, to discuss this as a, as a property. And let's say P equals 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, and R equals 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. Then let's look at S times 1 plus P. If we look at S times 1 plus P, we're going to get zero, obviously, because this is the zero vector that we're multiplying by. So this will be true. And similarly, uh, if we multiply by uh, 1 plus r, s times 1 plus r, we're also going to get zero. So the two premises in this example are true. And what about the product r times p? Is that non-zero? Well, let's see. If we take the product, we get 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. In this case, the product of these two is 0. So it does not follow that if these two things are 0, that this thing is necessarily non-zero. In other words, this is a counterexample to Dirapti, as it's stated. Now, in classical logic, Aristotle was aware of this. Aristotle knew that you had to approach this syllogism in a, in a different way. And the way he invoked things is to sort of add a special clause that basically comes down to eliminating the possibility of having an empty statement like this, a, a proposition that applies to none of the objects in our, uh, in our population. So we're going to augment this, we're going to prove this by inserting an additional assumption. Okay, so we're going to assume in addition that S does not equal zero. That is just an extra assumption that we're going to have to add to our premises. Okay, so now from S times 1 plus P, which is S plus SP equals zero, we get that S equals SP. And similarly for the other one, we get that S equals SR. Okay, now we are assuming that S is not equal to zero. Okay, but S is equal to SP because of that. 
And this S here can now be replaced with this SR because S equals SR. So we get SRP. And this is S times RP. So altogether we get 0 does not equal S times RP. So we can conclude that RP does not equal 0. So with this additional assumption, this existential import aspect, we can recover Aristotle's syllogism, and uh, so this is the way Boole's algebra would, would sort of automatically deal with this kind of situation. It doesn't exclude a property being null or not incident, but uh, it just recognizes that sometimes you have to treat that separately. So I'm going to leave you with the other third figure syllogism called Felopton to think about. It's PES. And RAS implies POR. So please analyze that and see if it's true or what additional assumptions you have to add to make it true. So we then basically have gone through all of Aristotle's syllogisms. There are also some fourth figure syllogisms that weren't actually studied by Aristotle but were added later, and you can analyze those as well. But basically, Boole basically accomplished. Uh, a complete understanding of the Aristotelian syllogisms from this purely algebraic point of view. It's a really quite a remarkable accomplishment. But however, after Boole, his algebra was modified by subsequent researchers. Uh, Charles Pierce was uh, prominent amongst them. So the algebra sort of became morphed to uh, something closer to the algebra of sets, which is now called Boolean algebra. And uh, so we want to get at understanding what exactly was going on there. What's the relationship between Boole's original algebra and this Boolean algebra that's somehow connected with uh, sets? And what are the connections with both of those algebras to the 20th century theory of circuits? So I want to summarize the situation uh, here with this little table. So here's the algebra of Boole that we've been talking about. Here are two propositions P or, and Q. And there are various on-off values, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So this runs through the four possible relative values of P and Q. And we're thinking of these as binary valued functions on some population, an element of a Boole algebra B sub 2 to the n, for some n. And then here are the two operations in Boole's algebra, the sum and the product. And we're thinking of these as sums and products of vectors, but they're actually component-wise. So they all comes down to just doing component-wise arithmetic with zeros and ones. And the sum is just mod 2 sum, 0, 1, 1, and 0, crucially. And the product is just mod 2 product, 0, 0, 0, and 1. And now, what about Boolean algebra? So Boolean algebra is almost the same as Boole algebra, except for one crucial difference. The crucial difference is right here. So there are also two operations, and we're going to call those operations with different names. Okay, We're not going to use addition and multiplication because then we're going to get confused as to what situation we're talking about. We're going to use this uh, sort of wedge and V uh, here. And we're going to think of this as being like a, uh, a union, and this is sort of like, like an intersection, a okay, logical union or logical intersection. And in fact, we do have a, a Venn diagram type of interpretation of these things. So, and the, the word that we use is just or. So this is or and this is and. So P or Q, 0, 0, 0. If one of these is on, then this is on. So if this is on or this is on, then this is on. This or this, this or this, this or this. So the only time when this is off is when both of these are off. And this one is the AND operation. This one's on precisely when both of these are on. In other words, when this one's on and this one's on. So that'll only happen in this case here. And otherwise, it's off. Now, set theoretically, this is quite useful because this corresponds to the set idea of a union and an intersection. If we represent P and Q by sets, then this uh, P and Q represents the intersection. And uh, the OR, P or Q, represents the union. 
So something is in, in this thing here, if it's either in P or Q, using the inclusive or type of interpretation, not the stoic exclusive one. And something is in P and Q, precisely when it's both in P and in Q. Now we can also look at a set theoretical interpretation back over here with these operations. And of course this PQ operation is the same as this uh, P and operation, so the picture for them is the same. But the picture here is somewhat different. Instead of having an OR over here, we have an exclusive OR over here. So notably this middle area is not colored. When we take P plus Q, if we're inside here, both P and Q are happening, then the sum is not happening. Okay, so at some level you could say, well, these are just two different choices for basic operations to set up an algebra. And that would be absolutely correct. Right? These are both actually very legitimate and interesting and useful choices to set up an algebra. But they are different. They are crucially different. And after Boole, the emphasis shifted from the algebra of Boole to the Boolean algebra. And to further complicate things, when Boolean algebra got going, and even these days, often nowadays the Boolean algebra uses not these symbols here, but plus and multiplication instead. So it's very easy to get confused between the modern Boolean algebra and the original algebra of Boole. So to try to minimize that confusion, we will try to use uh, these operations to denote these, um, this situation, so we can look at the algebra and see whether we're in this situation or this situation. So we now want to uh, assess what the differences are here and how this connects with uh, the algebra of sets. Okay, and uh, also it turns out with implication. So that's what we're going to do in our next video. It'll be quite interesting. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Balberger. Thanks for listening.